Harry's wife, part 73.5. Never interrupt me. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor. I am going to provide you, utilising the prominent example of Harry's wife, with more understanding about her behaviours and, more importantly, to enable you to understand more about narcissism in action, so that you increase your knowledge and it enables you to defend yourself more effectively. I am going to explain to you in this section of part 73 how, from our perspective, you must never interrupt us. And I have a lovely juicy morsel demonstrating the response of Harry's wife to being interrupted, and I will analyse that for you. Before we get there, however, you must understand that from our perspective, you must never interrupt us. Talking is something that narcissists invariably do very well. As the saying goes, talk is cheap. It's very easy. We can achieve a lot by the use of words alone rather than having to follow it up with action. It's important for you to understand that our narcissism operates in a manner to ensure that there is the preservation of energy, assets and resources. Why? Well, one never truly knows precisely when all of that energy and resources would need to be called on in order to achieve the prime aims, particularly that of control. And therefore, the narcissism operates, if you will, almost on an economy setting, trying to ensure that the narcissist achieves control, fuel, character traits and residual benefits with the minimum of effort and the maximum of return. Typically, this means that the use of words allows that. And by preserving energy when there is a crisis moment where there is particular threat to control caused by extensive wounding, the narcissism has enough power available from the fuel to ignite that fury to cause us to respond and act in a particular way so that we assert that control, nullify the threat, draw more fuel, etc. Thus the narcissism has to always keep something in the tank, if you will. That's why the narcissism utilises words so often to achieve our aims. Flattering you, insulting you, invalidating you, belittling you. It's far easier to say, I love you, than it is actually to demonstrate that love. Of course, with us, the demonstration of our love is false because we have no emotional empathy. The narcissist will invariably offer an early declaration of love, not always, but invariably will do so because it's easy. And the empathic victim, plagued by their own emotional thinking, has their love devotee trait corrupted so that they fall for these protestations of love. Of course, alongside it, there will be the flattery, the words of, you're the most beautiful woman that I've ever met, you're the most handsome man, you're a king to me, I've never met anybody like you, we have such a connection, it's amazing. The chemistry that we have is unlike anything I've ever experienced before. You're so absolutely, gorgeously, devilishly, wonderfully beautiful. I could eat you. You're so clever. I wish I was as clever as you. You've heard the insults. Flowery, sometimes unrealistic. Indeed, in some instances, you may have almost found them embarrassing. But nevertheless, it's all words. And it's because you're painted white. Words come easy to us, and of course we engage in lengthy monologues, particularly those of the upper mid-range. They particularly like to stand there and tell everybody how brilliant they are and talk about their latest activities alongside the upper lesser type B. Their particularly haughty behaviours manifest with lengthy monologues. But in any situation, we talk and you must not interrupt us. Of course, it's perfectly acceptable for us to interrupt you, after all. Who are you? You're beneath us. You're inferior to us. Our sense of entitlement, our lack of boundary recognition, a lack of accountability for our behaviour and the absence of emotional empathy means that if you're saying something, we can interrupt and talk over you. Particularly where you're talking so that you're challenging us and we have to nullify that threat. We cut you off and talk over you. Or... It might be that you're talking to somebody else and therefore you're wounding us and we have to interject to bring attention back onto us. It might be pointing out that you're wrong about something. It might be moving on to a completely different subject, rudely intervening by going, 
Oh, look, a butterfly, when somebody's trying to explain that they've got a problem with their shoulder. Indeed, the lower echelon narcissists will engage in such behaviour because, quite frankly, their narcissism tells them that they're bored of listening to you interfacing with somebody else, and therefore they're perfectly entitled to cry out, oh, look, over there, a Labrador running across the lawn, or look at the syrup fig on him. Doesn't he look ridiculous? Not only is it rude to talk over you, but it is completely unrelated to what you're talking about. But that kind of narcissist, invariably lesser, simply doesn't care. What has to be done is to bring attention back onto the narcissist, thus gaining control and, of course, drawing fuel. Thus, we can interrupt you, but you must never, ever interrupt us. To do so either causes wounding where you talk across us to somebody else, or is challenge fuel if you interrupt us and talk to us. So, for instance, if we're telling you all about the wonders of our fascinating pasta connection and you interrupt us to say, actually, do you fancy watching Line of Duty this evening? You've given us fuel because you're talking to us, but you've challenged us because you've cut us short as we're extolling the virtues of different types of pasta. You're not allowed to do that, and therefore you will receive a response from us. The fury will ignite and we will lash out in a certain way. We may, for instance, say, do you mind? I was just talking to you. Or, we'll talk about that later, and then we continue talking, and we dismiss what you have to say. We may even berate you. Who do you think you are interrupting me? You're always doing that. You never listen to me. Note the black and white thinking and the use of the absolutes with always and never. Quite simply, you interrupting us either is challenge fuel, where you are talking to us and interrupt what we're saying, or if you happen to interrupt us to talk to somebody else, essentially talking over us, cutting our flow away, that wounds us. And of course, that is an even worse outcome. Where you interrupt us, you automatically become painted black. You're traitorous, treacherous. You threaten our sense of control. You are, in effect, signalling to us that we don't matter, that we're not important, and our narcissism will not allow that. Galvanising us through the ignition of fury and particular thoughts, such as, who does this person think they are to interrupt me? Or, what does she think she's talking about? Or, that's abject, asinine nonsense that's just being spouted by that person. Whatever it takes, dependent upon the school of narcissists, the narcissism will do this by way of a feeling and a thought to galvanise the narcissist into action. So having explained all of that to you so you understand the dynamics of this, let's get down and have a look at a little example of Harry's wife as she finds herself interrupted. You will have seen from the clip that Harry's wife is at some kind of event. It looks like she's in a marquee, judging by what's behind her, and there's a small group of people and she is articulating her position with the waving of her hands and clasping of it, and just as, about she's, just as she is about to say something further in this repeated clip, the lady stood to her right interjects, offering some kind of observation or comment. And at that moment as she speaks, sees the reaction from Harry's wife. The head whips round, and in that instant, because of the wounding that's instantaneously caused by the lady to her right interrupting her, her fury ignites, and immediately we see the death stare, as if to say, Who the fuck are you? Where did you come from? Who do you think you are to interrupt me when I am talking? It is interesting to see that the head whips round. It's that she doesn't even see that the individual is next to her. That's because she's so caught up in her own self-absorption. And her reaction is one in terms of spinning around so quickly as if to say, who's that and what are you doing? But then notice the way that the eyes flare up. The hatred appears for that moment. The how dare you, the antipathy flowing from those dark pits. And of course, this is entirely typical. As a mid-range narcissist, her facade is intact a lot of the time, but in certain instances we get these micro-moments which show us an interesting underside to the behaviour. 
She talks, she articulates what's going on, explaining something, and then the lady to her right comments. The head whips round, she stares and then looks up at her as if to say, who are you? What do you think you are to interrupt me? And the hatred shows immediately the ignition of fury that is caused by the narcissism to galvanise Harry's wife into doing something about this interruption. Unfortunately, the clip doesn't show us what happened next, whether she then talked over the lady or the lady continued to talk. But either way, the clip that we've seen serves a very useful purpose in demonstrating the effect of interrupting the narcissist and, in particular, the reaction of Harry's wife. This again underpins the fact that she is an unaware narcissist. A greater narcissist would respond in a much more charming and appropriate fashion, would turn, allow the person to speak, would make a mental note of who do you think you are to interrupt me, but would be able to maintain the facade. A greater narcissist wouldn't show the contempt and hatred in the way that Harry's wife does. The facade would be maintained and a mental note would be made to punish the interrupter in some shape or form at a later juncture. It might, of course, happen in the instant. A polished grater might turn and say, well, that's all very interesting. Thank you for your contribution in a somewhat patronising way, which appears as if they're being kind and polite, but actually they are not. Or they may well go, that's very interesting. It's not meant, of course, but it maintains the facade. And the greater narcissist will deal with this transgressor at a later juncture by punishing them in some shape or form. It might be later that day, it could be some way down the line. But you wouldn't see a greater respond in that way. The aware greater, and of course I as the ultra, we wouldn't respond in that way. We wouldn't show that little flash because we would be able to maintain the facade. Our response would be more valid, would be much more polished. Of course, we would be wounded by the interruption just the same, but because we have a much higher threshold on our ignited fury in terms of the control, our reaction would be different. Here, we see the unaware mid-range narcissist unable, even just for that little instant, even though it's only short, to keep the facade intact. She's, in essence, taken unawares by the interruption, and her narcissism scrambles, causing her to give the look of hatred before the facade would undoubtedly be reimposed. Further demonstration of narcissism in action, the ignition of fury, the response of wounding, the effect of an interruption, and the distinction between mid-range and greater with regard to re responding to such a situation. Join me in part 73.6 as we continue analysis, but from a different angle with regard to the behaviours of Harry's wife.